You're listening to the 2018 Nelson Arts Festival Page and Blackmore Readers and Writers Program. This session features Paul Bensman in conversation with Debs Martin. My name is Kerry Sunderland and I'm the coordinator of the program. I'd like to say a big thank you to Page and Blackmore who are the sponsors of Readers and Writers. And I'm, it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Debs Martin who's chairing this session and will of course introduce you to Paul. Thanks, Debs. Thank you, and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big round of thank you, and uh, thank you all for coming out this um, Labour Weekend Monday. A lot of conservationists are obviously um, will take to the hills, but I'm very pleased that many of you uh, took to founders today to hear this um, presentation from Paul Bensman about his uh, fantastic book. Now, um, I was asked to do this by Kerry, and it was a great honour for me to, um, to be able to uh, interview Paul today, because this is, to, to my mind, a really seminal book in, in terms of the conservation history of New Zealand, and one not well documented before. But before I kick off, I'm just going to give an introduction of Paul. Paul is a fifth-generation Nelsonian. Um, and his campaigning started in, back in the Forest Service days when they were um, bulldozing a track through, um, gold, um, through the Flora Valley towards Golden Bay and the Tablelands. Um, at age 19, he drove to Fiordland specifically to work on the Save the Manapuri campaign in his old Vauxhall, but he got there just about as the campaign was almost over. Um, four years later, he joined the Forest Service head office as a spy for the Native Forest Action Council, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about that later this morning. Um, and then in 1978, while he was Secretary of NFAC, he and his wife joined the Puriora treetop occupation with the role of helping the protest leader Stephen King at that time and the liaison with iwi around that area and that work continued then as well into the Fidanaki campaign. Um, he left the movement in the 80s and 90s to work as a newspaper and media journalist and worked for the Nelson Evening Mail for a time as well before moving to Wellington and working in the press and media gallery and working uh, eventually for the Green Party as well, where a lot of his activism was continued, particularly in the work in saving rainforests. He also started uh, a number of campaigns, in, including the work on uh, genetic engineering. He returned to study a master's in media and communication and has since then uh, did a thesis on West Papua uh, he visited there and under disguise as a bird watcher and hid in a church for eight days while Papuan activists interviewed him, visited him for interviews. Um, and some of the Papuan leaders came out of hiding in the jungle, especially to be interviewed. So I think today we've got the perfect person to have written the story, Fight for the Forest. No my, Heidi my, welcome Paul. Um, it's really good to have you here with us today. Thank Tēnā you. <laughs> and I will, before I start, also acknowledge um, um, Craig Potton and Robbie Burton here from uh, Potton and Burton Publishing, who were also involved in this book. But, but Craig, uh, sorry, Craig's over there. Um, Paul, <laughs> you're here. Paul, before we start, you've got an impressive CV of activism and journalism, and I suppose it's no doubt led to you being the perfect author for the book, but Fight for the Forest, it's a big story. So can you just tell us a little bit about the genesis of the story and where it came from? The idea wasn't mine, it was Craig's. Ah. Um, <laughs> so Craig thought that we should write our own story, our own history of the forest conservation movement. Um, Otherwise, somebody else would write it for us. And Craig also made the point that some of the New Zealand histories, even Michael King's history and Jane Belich's history, um, don't include very much about the conservation movement. So we needed to write our own story. And it's very much from our perspective. It doesn't claim to be unbiased. Um, but it's, it's also very important that we've been able to interview so many people, some of the, the main players. Not everyone. I mean, there were thousands of people 
involved in the movement. And, and one of my regrets is obviously I can't interview everyone who was involved in the movement. Um, at branch level, we had people who were, who were working day and night, sometimes for years, um, to, to save the forests. And I can't include everyone. But I've interviewed, I think, uh, over 100 people, travelled around the country for three years. Mm. So, so how long did it take you to do those interviews? Yeah, th three, three years. years. Three years, yeah. yeah. And, um, and the writing itself, you, you've, you've brought it together in a, a powerful book. And for those of you that are sitting on the front there, but when I picked it up, I thought, this is, this is a dense book, but it's really structured in quite an interesting way that for me was a very compelling read. So what drove you to think about the way that you were going to tell the story? Um, by actually talking to, at the start, for some months, talking to some of the main players. And I want to acknowledge Gwenny here. Uh, Gwenny Davis is actually one of the heroes of the movement. Derek Shaw, um, Craig, Arnold, Arnold Heine, who's um, 92, um, uh, one of the, the patrons of Federated Mountain Clubs, was trying to get here today. Um, I talked to him yesterday, and, and uh, he was very supportive. And Arnold, Arnold was one of the founders of ECO which was a confederation of conservation and outdoor groups. So he was one of the main players too. And I'm sure I've missed other people that I, that I can't see from here. Paul, you're right. It was a, it was a story that really had it, its genesis in a way in Nelson itself yeah. and, and kicking off the Native Forest Action Council. Can you, and you document that in your book. Can you tell us about some of those early days from what you have found out in this, in this writing? Well, uh, my personal opinion is, is that New Zealand was being sort of recolonised in the, in the mid-20th century. So we had the Second World War, we, we had um, censorship, and that censorship continued on. We had the waterfront strike in 1951. Actually, there, it wasn't well publicised at the time, despite what happened. We had the, the Bastion Point um, evictions, 1952, Te Pudu o Tamaki. The meeting house was um, destroyed um, because they didn't want the Queen to see a Maori settlement when she went past. The people were, were kicked off their land. There was a, seemed to be a um, discomfort about anything indigenous in the mid-20th um, uh, century, the 1950s. Most people don't know that the record year for milling native forest was in 1953. And people at the time wouldn't have known it was going on. And, and that, that kept happening uh, through the 60s and, and 1970s. So it, it wasn't until the early 1970s, really, and the Manapuri campaign, which Craig was deeply involved in, that people started saying enough. Right, right. So that was uh, the kind of time that you see as, as being the genesis for the kickoff date for this book for yeah, you? Yeah, the late, yeah. late 1960s, early 1970s, yeah. Right, okay. And so, like, I was really engaged with this story right from start to finish because it starts at that time in quite a compelling place. And, and as you kind of say, we came to that perfect storm of the 1970s. So... Tell us a little bit about what kicked that movement off, and perhaps we might put up the photo of the some of those early early days and what people were looking at. Is that what with you? So these are some of the photos from the book. But um, can you tell us a little bit about this image? So this uh, is this is I don't know if you can all see, but this is Pikiariki Road. This is Pudiwara Forest, and this is I love this photo because it's it's typical of the Native Forest Action Council field trips which Gwynny was one of the main organisers of, and, and Craig. But there are lots of people involved um, in organising those field trips. We had hundreds on some of those field trips um, from all around the country. And I, this is um, Guy Salmon's um, photo. He's one of the local heroes as well in the conservation movement. Um, I think it was taken in 1977. So Pudiwara Forest... Somewhere near here is the treetop, the famous treetop protest, 
which I write quite a lot about in this book. Um, so this wasn't a, a terrible accident. This was the Forest Service. Clear felling, a huge areas. There used to be 100,000 hectares of mixed podocarp forest west of Taupo. Um, up until the, the Second World War, and since the Second World War, they logged about 83% of it. I hope I've got that right, Gwenny. <laughs> and 80% of the, I'm talking about the lowland, mixed pot of carp, rich forest. And so we were trying to save the last um, about 17,000 hectares, that's all, in um, Pūrōra, Waihaha, and Tihoi. Um, so we had field trips, and one of the, the main leaders of this campaign at the time was Stephen King from Auckland, and he came here when there was a, a huge burn-off while this was happening in 1977, and the, the, the young Māori um, sawmillers had left some of the big totara trees, and while Stephen King was there on one of his camping trips, he met a young Māori um, worker and a few others with a chainsaw and they were told by the Forest Service to take down those last of the big totara trees. One of the totara trees somewhere in this area was thought to be one of the, the um, thickest in the country. It was 12 metres um, in girth and Tane Mahu to the big kauri tree I think is about 14 metres. And um, so we don't think there's anything uh, even approaching that these days. So the Forest Service did this without any public consultation. There was no Official Information Act, um, no Resource Management Act. And like I said, there was still this um, feeling that government departments could do what they liked. There wasn't so much censorship as a, a lack of public consultation in the 1970s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a horrific sight, isn't it? Yeah. And, and so taking people to those places, and they look some pretty old buses going in there, don't they? And yeah. obviously there's lots to be about four or five. So a lot of people going into that place has sparked off the movement, I guess. Mm. Yeah. And so do, do you want to talk a little bit about the genesis of, of the Native Forest Action and, and the Action Council and, yeah, the so, work there? Yeah, this is, this is more Gwydion and Guy's story, I think. But, uh, well, the Native Forest Action Council came from the Beach Forest Action Council, um, which was set up uh, not, not locally, actually by a group of Auckland University students who camped out. Um, they had a trip around the South Island and camped out at the Anatori River mouth. So in a way, it did start from Nelson, the Beach Forest Action Committee. But that was focused mostly on the huge beach scheme. So there were something like a million acres of Nelson West Coast and Southland um, forest, not just beach, a lot of it with Rimu, uh, that was going to be uh, part of the scheme, and they were going to leave about 150,000 hectares of that as reserves. They were going to completely transform the West Coast, so it would be one huge plantation, mostly of pines, um, in parts, beach plantations. So the Beach Forest Action Council was set up for that. The Native Forest Action, Action Council came in 1975 uh, with the launch of the Maria Declaration, which a lot of people here um, were deeply involved in. So there's a lot of these stories that are packed into this book, aren't they? Yeah. There's the story yeah. of forest after forest, and yeah. each story you kind of go into those things, yeah. you know, the issues of who was involved. It was quite powerful for me um, reading some of those stories, and I just wonder if you want to, you've got a reading here, one of the first readings in the prologue of your book, okay. um, which, which kind of, I guess, kicks off the essence of that, of that occupation time. Yep. Would you like to read that now? So this, this one's actually set here um, during the protest. And just as a, as a bit of background, the Forest Service was spraying, when we were there, the Forest Service was spraying um, 245T by helicopter over this to make sure not a single native fern or whatever could, could come up. This was all going to go into pines. 
And I'm talking about a 17-year-old protester. So we had, a, we had three king brothers, a Stephen, 25, um, his brother Bernard, 17, and his brother Sam, um, who was 12. And Sam was up the, the highest tree. But this is from Bernard's perspective. <clears throat> there are omens for Bernard at Pūriora, 10 or maybe a dozen riflemen, New Zealand's smallest bird, and usually seen alone, welcomed the group on Tuesday by darting up and down the trunk of the TV totara that he was about to climb. The TV totara was a special totara that was close to the road so the TV crews could film it. <laughs> <laughs> In the middle of a logging road, Bernard had seen Prince of Wales feather shoots um, poking through the through the shingle. That kind of fern is supposed to need moisture and, and shade, he said. They were in full sunlight, as if fighting back. The birds around the meadow, the meadow tree he was up, seemed to sense his purpose. With white-headed kaka screeching and whistling just above him, and the chattering of smaller light green and red parrots, kakariki, that buzzed past in flocks. Rarest of all was the kōkako which has the most haunting, echoing and beautiful of New Zealand bird calls. The large slate grey birds with black masks and blue wattles were so little known in 1978 that the press called them New Zealand crows and the Auckland star blue parrots. Bernard watched a pair of these semi-flightless birds perform a leaping zigzag up and down the canopy. Kōkako are usually quite shy, he said, but these were so close I could hear the whooshing sound of their small wings. Suddenly, it was like a monster clanking through the forest, crunching everything up. The bulldozer heading for, for Bernard stopped some 50 metres away. Then chainsaw started and went on and on. His mood sank. This meant the end of another forest giant. Bernard could see nothing, but he heard the, the tree crash into others, and he felt the thump when it hit the ground. The bulldozer started up again and came thundering through, bringing with it the sound of saplings snapping and branches breaking right up to Bernard's tree. There was a reporter, he said. He must have known Stephen's platform was here. I could just see his face looking up through a gap. Bernard put his forefinger over his lips so as to urge the journalist to keep quiet. He still had no thought of danger. The protesters, protesters had agreed that whatever happened, they would hide. Chainsaw started again, and Bernard knew it was the end of the big matai, perhaps 700 years old, beside him. Only then did he think of the matai's size and the risk if, he, if it lent his way. That tree took a long, long time long time to fall, he said. It toppled at right angles to Bernard, cracking into and flattening small trees and seemed to shake the whole forest when it hit the ground. All the protesters had whistles and an agreed alert code, long calls for loggers or police and short calls for media. Bernard took a deep breath and blew the whistle as hard and long as he could. When he stopped, he could hear the timber workers debating whether the whist whistling was a kaka, Bernard knew then that they had not deliberately targeted Stephen King's tree and had no idea anyone was up there. It was time to stop hiding. Hey, Bernard yelled, why did you cut down my tree? There was silence, then swearing. They got such a shock, Bernard said. They were stunned. They knew they could have killed me. The matai was the last tree in the 40 hectare block that the government department would fell. The loggers walked out. The forest was saved. It's a very powerful story. Very powerful story of that movement and of that time. So there were a lot of people who were clearly very passionate mm. about in their forests and, and, and taking to the trees and saying that. And I know you've you've referred to a few of them here. Are there other characters that have that you interviewed that told such compelling stories during this time? Yeah, there are. Um, and I don't want to forget the 
um, the young protesters who were still fighting at the end of the, the 20th century in the native forest action movement on the west coast. This um, campaign lasted for several years. So the, the Pudiora campaign was, the actual tree top sitting was over um, almost within a week, actually, certainly within two weeks, um, because there was a moratorium on logging from then on, and we had to go through the difficult negotiations with the government, which Gwynny and Craig and others um, were deeply involved in. So the negotiations to make, make the moratorium permanent. But the Native Forest Action Campaign on, at Charleston on the West Coast lasted for several years. It was modelled on the Purdy Order treetop protest. So they had a treetop protest which started in February um, 1997. But many of those young people ended up staying on the coast for, for years, actually. Yeah. yeah. And, we're, and, and we might come back to, to that one in a moment, actually, because I think we've got some photos yeah. of that coming yeah. up. So we'll come back to that. Just one of the things that struck me during this time is there was there was a lot of young people, and, and I do just want to acknowledge the work that people seem to set aside their lives yeah. um, to save these forests, and certainly those images that you show are really, really compelling. And I know that another of the the things that stood out for me in the book was the the young activism and the passion that occurred as opposed to potentially some of the old guard of, dare I say it, Forest and Bird, who I work for. There, was, there were tensions that were playing out as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and, and some of your stories from that time? Well, one of the, one of the reasons, um, I don't know if Gwenny and Derek and Craig and others would agree with me, but one of the reasons this happened was because there was so much else happening at the same time. So um, I talked about the beach scheme before, but we also, at the time of the Maria Declaration, we, we had the Ocarito campaign. And uh, so that was when Forest and Bird and the Native Forest Action Council were really at loggerheads, and, and that was where that battle between the groups was being played out mostly at, at Ocarito. Um, so what happened at, what happened at Ocarito was, was that Native Forest Action Council didn't know what was going to be happening down there until there was an advert in the Christchurch Press uh, advertising a huge volume of native timber. And one of, it, one of NFAC's full-time campaigners, Jerry McSweeney, who's another hero, big hero, um, who had a major role in, in saving native forests, and still does. Um, Jerry McSweeney runs the Lake Moidaki Wilderness Lodge at another Wilderness Lodge at Arthur's Pass with Ann Saunders, his wife. Um, so Jerry saw the map of the logging roads at Ocarito um, around the wrong way uh, on the desk of one of the head foresters at Hokitika. So he was visiting the Forest Service yeah. and got the chance to just and, see and the, his map. Yeah. The Forest Service was telling uh, Native Forest Action Council nothing. That there was all there was secrecy. So the first that in fact knew that they were about to tackle Ocarito was what um, Jerry saw on the forester's desk. Yeah. And so in fact started campaigning against Ocarito and Forest and Bird started campaigning against NFAC um, publicly and uh, called uh, NFAC the Guy Salmon Brigade, amongst other things. Um, there was a big, uh, one of many Easter gatherings at Ocarito. Uh, it was the start of the big Easter gatherings in 1976, I think. And um, the Forest and Bird two leaders of Forest and Bird went down a week before the gathering and got on a TV1 or television New Zealand as it was then and, and said that um, basically in fact was a bunch of radical, radicals um, with um, impetuous and impossible demands um, and in and, and one of the Forest and Bird magazines uh, Forest and Bird said 
that they didn't think any harm would come from selectively logging Okarito and Waikuku Path. Um, but it only took... This is the other great thing. It, it, although there was this uh, conflict, I've found out by doing all the research and interviewing the main players, that at the same time as there was this public... Um, horrible, sort of messy um, conflict, that there, were, there was a lot of work behind the scenes, especially by branches. Branches of the local, especially in places like Nelson, uh, West Coast, uh, um, Central North Island, and um, Christchurch. Mm -hmm. So in fact, at Forest and Brood branches were trying to work together as one. And they did, mostly. And with it, but because of that, within a few months, the forest and bird mm -hmm. stance on Okarito and Waikuku Bar was exactly the same as Infax. Yeah, yeah. And so there were times, obviously, where those things, as you've just said, those tensions played out, but there were people who were working really hard to mm. change those things. That's really important. Another, another quote in your book that, that stood out for me was when you were talking about working with Māori, and you said their voices were being smothered inadvertently by the conservation movement itself. And I thought that was, that was quite a powerful statement just in the, in the middle of a chapter that I was reading. Can you just explain to me a little bit about that? Because it's probably something I think that has, I suppose, you know, similar stories that come right through into the present day, actually. Mm. Mm. So... We were, we were going, basically going to the Māori and, and saying, um, can you help us with this particular campaign? Uh, you know, this area's got a beauti beautiful view and we want to try and retain this view. And, I mean, this is a, I'm summarising. <laughs> and they would say, well, never, never mind about the view, what about the, our freshwater fish? Uh, what about our eels in that forest? What about our pickle pickle? Um, what about our chiefly giant trees that... Um, we don't want cut down. We were kind of trying to s save the same thing, but from a different perspective. And and they would say, well, you know, how about you help us? Um, we're talking past each other for for a while. Those conservative forest and bird people generally didn't make much effort in the mid twentieth century to liaise with with iwi. But the Native Forest Action Council did. And um, I want to uh, compliment Guy for leading that uh, sort of um, dialogue. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it was successful. Um, in fact, was able to support young Māori who were running their own conservation campaigns. For ex example, um, Tamaiti, who was trying to stop widespread logging of regenerating native forest in the Uruwera uh, and uh, in fact put its resources behind him mm. and his supporters. And, and you felt that that was an important role for you in the movement as well? Yeah, um, so I, it's an interest I've had since I was, I was young. Mm. Um, yeah, my dad's got a Maori name and, and my um, grandparents were very interested in, and had a close re relationship with local Maori which actually goes back to the the first Benzman's here. <laughs> um, but in the, the Puri Order campaign, um, we were all, all of us, from leadership down to the, the people on the ground, all very sensitive about the need to liaise with the local Māori workers. Um, Stephen King was excellent at that. They hosted us at, at their marae at Mangakino during the protest. This is, this is, it sounds ironic. The, um, the workers at the, in the forest hosted us at their marae. We had a meetings with them on the marae. We had a meeting with them in the sawmilling town at Barry, Barryville. We weren't allowed in any, in any houses because the houses were owned by the sawmilling companies. So we met in the, the dirt street in the middle of town. There was one telephone box. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't have uh, telephones. And we had this uh, big, big meeting on 
on, on a Sunday, and Stephen King was there in his bare feet and describing the um, riches of the forest. And many of the young people there had no idea that old Kaumatua were always with us, always on our sides there. Um, one of the workers actually went and rang the union official to ask if they could come out in support of us. And these people knew they were going to lose their jobs and they were going to lose their homes and their community if they did. Um, we were trying to get pines into the sawmills, but that didn't happen. Um, and um, the, one of the local Komatua uh, sent a telegram to Muldoon, who was the Prime Minister, and other ministers uh, totally supporting us. That's a really powerful story in that, in that movement and that relationship, which, you know, I think, as you said, you know, having those uh, staying on the marae as part of the gathering and bringing together those stories so that actually you could forge a future together is something that, that we can still continue to work with, I think, in the work that we do. That what really struck me too is when I pick up this book, there's beautiful photos by Craig Potton, stunning photos in there by Craig Potton. But the, the things I really like is a photo, one is of um, Gwenny at her home at, I think she said to me earlier just before, at midnight on a Get Stetna, um, you know, cranking out uh, the material that was needed to get this information out across the world. And it struck me as I read the book that there was Gwenny Davis, there was Annie Wheeler, um, in, in the early days of NFAC, and then when we came to those, the later days with, uh, um, like you said, in Charleston, there was Annette Cotter, Bridget Gibb. There was, it's 125 years since women have got the vote, but it really struck me when I read the book that there were a lot of strong male characters, no doubt, you know, Jerry McSweeney, Guy Salmon and those. But when I was looking and reading this book, I thought, you know what the glue often was? Was those women, those wahine toa, who, who really, um, you know, they were the organisers, they were the strategists, they were often the mediators, they were out there doing the displays, and they were grinding the get stetner out at night. Um, I think we've got a... a oh, hey? It had a motor. Oh, it did it? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I want to put this photo up here. There's a couple of, I asked, um, I asked Paul to give me photos, and this is one of Bridget Gibb, who's... Um, one of the young women in the Native Forest Action in Charleston. Do you want to... This was a specially powerful photo for you, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it just demonstrates total commitment. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> so you may, maybe you need to explain what she's doing here. <laughs> she's under a helicopter uh, at um, the Westport Airport. This is February 1999. So it's tw 22 years after the black and white photo we've had up there of Pudi Order. So this was the Charleston protest. Bridget was one of the first ones up the trees in February 1997. So this is two years later. She's still on the coast protesting. She's living on the coast. She a a, was a young botanist um, who totally dedicated her life to the movement, as Gwenny did and as Derek did and, and Craig and others. Bridget um, and others, they ran along the beach in the dark because they didn't want to have any cars around the airport. They didn't want to alert anybody. They ran, ran along the beach and they got there at dawn. This is a logging helicopter, um, heli harvest. Some of the protesters had black tape and they changed the words heli harvest on the chopper to hell harvest. <laughs> And we had another young um, protest leader, Steve Abel, who chained himself with a bicycle lock at the top to the rotors. Bridget is in a, um, it's a galvanised iron pipe that's welded at the top. And, um, and also inside that pipe, she has her hands in handcuffs. They, uh, she's got a drinking straw there and a blanket, and she's determined to stay there for as long as it takes. And she was there all day. Uh, while the, the conservationists were, were kicked off the airport, I think about five of them were arrested. 
And so she was left there, and, but the loggers and the, the Heli Harvest people and some of the loggers stayed and threatened to urinate on her and were yelling ab abuse. And the forest service had to cover her face um, with a blanket while they got in and um, with cutting gear. Uh, with, because of the sparks, they had to cover her face when they, when they finally cut her off, but it, it took all day. Mm. And um, yeah, just following up what mm. you were saying about the un unsung, unsung heroes, especially women, um, this was one of the main motivations for the book, actually, is, is, is that there are these unsung heroes in the conservation movement. Yeah. And uh, I've got this um, thing about the fact that we've got a bit of a cultural cringe about celebrating our own homegrown heroes, people who re rebel against the system, um, but make change mm. in the end for the better. And, well, Kate, Kate Shepherd, for example. Now, I, I never heard about Kate, Kate Shepherd at school. No. And we're, this year we're, we're finally celebrating her and the women's suffrage movement. And she was a radical at mm -hmm. the time who made great change as a, as a leader. And the government didn't give women the vote. Mm -hmm. They had to fight for it. And it was the same with way back in the 19th century, late 19th century, Te Whiti o Rongomai, Tohu Kākahu, mm -hmm. um, long before Mahatma Gandhi. And we never heard about them at school. And they took on the colonial government. Um, yeah. So, I mean, in the past, we've celebrated Kiri Te Kanawa. We've celebrated Sir Edmund Hillary. They were famous on the international stage. These, were, these are people here and here um, who made huge changes, um, huge positive change to New Zealand. And it was about time we recorded that. And that's one of the main motivations for this book that um, Robbie over here and Craig and myself have been talking about. So, I mean, and, and that change can't be underestimated for those of us in the conservation movement. We're talking hundreds of thousands of hectares of forest that were saved. And we're also talking ultimately in some of those negotiations as well to a change in the way that the government's structured in terms of bringing about the Department of Conservation as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Big stuff. Now, the other, of course, unsung hero in this book is, is, is yourself a little bit as well. And uh, I did allude to in the biography that, that you actually played quite a critical role and, and not a role that's easy to play when you became a spy in the New Zealand Forest Service. Um, maybe you could just start with, do you want to start with a reading or a commentary about that? Because I think it's um, yeah, first I'd like to say, I was just a foot soldier for a short yeah, period. Just a foot soldier. Um, they all were foot soldiers, <laughs> I believe me. And, uh, I mean, Robbie and I both call ourselves foot soldiers. We were leaders of the movement. So what I did is an example of what uh, many hundreds of others did. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is um, a chapter of about my nine months in the Forest Service head office. I managed to get myself a job with the director of research, Dr. Colin Bassett. And, um, and I've kind of made up with him recently. Uh, I visited him for the first time in 40 years. He was a director of research and he's become, he became a bit of a mentor for this book, although he wouldn't say that. Um, Colin Bassett, as a director of research, had every secret report going on the wildlife um, and forests and soils and everything else. And we couldn't get it because there was no official information act. Um, we would, I remember writing a letter to the Forest Service about the Flora Saddle Road and asking why they were building a road through the Flora Saddle and down towards Golden Bay. They took two months to respond and said they didn't have the authority to release the information requested. That's what, we were getting that all the time. So that's why I joined the Forest Service. So, and this starts off with um, what Gwynny and Guy did with some information I gave them. <laughs> On the 
On, a, on 1st of October, Davis and Sam, Salmon issued a seminal, hard-hitting press statement totaling four pages, arguing that the Forest Service was running a private intelligence service, keeping personal files on scientists from other departments and manipulating research funds to stifle independent criticism. NFAC did not name names, but the Forest Service's main target was no office-bound civil servant, but a gruff and straight speaking possum hunter from Hari Hari, South Westland, Kevin Smith. So Kevin Smith was one of the conservation heroes too. He worked on a Forest Service contract studying kahikatea as part of a botany PhD, but was also a pro prodigious writer to newspapers and magazines. He told the listener, for example, that, quote, present official conservation policies amount to little more than empty rhetoric and that kōkako habitat at Horohoro near Utorua was being systematically destroyed to, to provide cheap building timber for railways um, department goods sheds. The government could have embraced Smith as a young conservationist helping create enlightened policies, but Canterbury University and the Forest Service instead tried to silence him, largely because of Minister Ven Young's paranoia about critics. In the mid-1970s, the minister and his senior foresters were giving mixed messages, publicly promoting highly selective logging to save forests, while also attacking young scientists who were suggesting such changes were needed. I'll just interrupt a bit and say that um, we haven't mentioned yet uh, the huge role that young scientists played, who gave up uh, they, they, were, they had PhDs, many of them. They gave up um, careers to work full-time on, on conservation um, campaigns, and st including staying at Cruena, people like uh, Selwyn June and Peter Grant and others. Yep. Smith's scientific reports were dispassionate and his report on Kahikatea was leaked by me, <laughs> not by him. And so too was a memo between Conway and Bassett widely circulated around head office about Smith's open op opposition to the, to the department. So this press release was, was the biggest that Gwenny put out, the biggest yet on the, on the beach scheme. It, it was the biggest, it caused the most publicity. Television aired the Bassett-Conway memo and other documents leading to further clampdowns on scientists and staff. Bassett this is Colin Bassett, asked me to install a lock on his door. <laughs> and not to keep confidential papers on my desk overnight. And to send out a letter headed responsibility to, to the Minister of Forests to about 20 people around the country, members of the Scientific Coordinating Committee for Beach Research. Um, the Evening Post reported that the letter... I don't know how they got that. <laughs> um, <laughs> warned members that minutes and working papers should not be used to embarrass the minister, and even went so far as to tell members that legal action would be taken against any thieves caught stealing. It was a difficult bit of time for all those caught in the Ferrari. Jeff Walls, Jeff Walls was another young scientist who did a lot for the conservation movement, but he was working the DSIR at the time. Jeff Walls said he was treated like a leper by many DSIR colleagues and was stalked by two Forest Service employees in the Ohikanui River, a tributary of the Buller, during a forest survey with his supervisor, Jeff Park, another conservation hero. They, would approach, they wouldn't approach and talk to us, but were sneaking around watching what we were doing. Colin Bassett himself felt cornered with no option but to challenge the mafia-like claim that Gwynny had put in her press release, including on television. Quote, I hadn't been trained in dealing with the media, he said recently. Um, this is when I interviewed him. I was opening a building next day and was called Joe Bananas Bassett. I had a neighbour who wouldn't speak to me. People rang me up and said things like, I thought you were an honourable honorable man. Conway and Young discussed calling in the police or SIS to interview head office staff, but decided instead on 
um, David Bradshaw, the State Services Commission's in-house lawyers. I had written a seven-page paper for Wellington Ecology Action in 1975, criticising the Forest Service for bulldozing a road through, through Virgin Beach Forest in the Flora Valley. But when it came to my turn to be interviewed, it was obvious the document hadn't surfaced. On the 13th of October 1976, after chronic stomach, stomach pains, I was x-rayed and a doctor suspected early stages of a duodenal ulcer. I was not cut out to be a spy. This person whom I worked most closely with and was undermining was a man I had come to love like a father. Born in Hokitika in 1929, Colin Bassett grew up on the west coast Taramakau Valley, joined the Forest Service as a technical trainee and field worker in 1948 and had the quite kind of quietly spoken and polite modesty typical of, a, of an expert bushman. Bassett looked me in the eye some weeks before I left and said, you're not a conservationist, are you, Paul? It was impossible to return his gaze when I said no. Mm. And I think you've got, um, uh, I suppose, an epilogue on that story that you want to tell as well, haven't you? Yeah, I've told a little bit of, about uh, meeting up with Colin Bassett, but I also met up with other foresters who were extremely influ influential, including a guy called Bob Collins. Um, Bob Collins was like Enfax Antichrist in the Furunaki Valley. Um, yeah, he was very aggressive. He organised roadblocks to stop um, the kind of field trip you saw up there. That didn't happen. We didn't get up the Furunaki Valley um, because of the roadblocks. He, he got the whole village out. But also what he did in the forest was soul-destroying. He was mostly responsible for d destroying the last dense tortura stand in New Zealand. Um, it was estimated there was 45% tortura in the Mangawidi Basin and in, in the early 1970s. He got it clear felled and planted in pines. He reckoned um, there was some strange disease in there and the tortura had to be saved. It was found later that it was a possum problem. Um, there were record possum prices at the time. They, sh they could have sent possum hunters in there. But anyway, that, most of that basin became pines. But I wanted to interview him for the book. I visited him in two, uh, 2016, and um, he invited me for dinner, asked me to stay the night. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but he also gave me this, um, which was a, a, a sort of a difficult situation for me. He does wood turning, and this is a piece of tortura from the Furunaki forest that he's made. Mm. Um, the point I was trying to make is that uh, even though we're at loggerheads with these people, uh, sometimes they, they could be extremely friendly and likeable mm. one on one. Mm. Mm. That that um, that kind of a, you know the early campaigns, the ones through the 70s and 80s, seem to have that relationship was at the core. The later action around Charleston seemed to be a lot more. There seemed to be a lot more tension and aggression between the community and the protesters, yep. which comes through in your book. Yep. Do you, is there anything to you want to say about that? Um, There's probably a, a f several things at play. I, I don't think the Native Forest Action w was set up. Um, they, some of them, some of their leaders would probably disagree with me, but I, I don't think they were they were set up enough to lobby at Parliament to the same extent that Gwenny did, um, and Guy and others. Um, so it was a steep learning curve for them. Although, to be fair, uh, they had as one of their main supporters and organisers, Nicky Hager, who did uh, do a lot of good work later in the campaign on that. Um, but also, I mean, the Purdy Order project was in a different 
um, place uh, with um, local Māori being very reluctant about what they were doing to the west coast. I mean, the Native Forest Action Council group, you know, they went into, the <laughs> into a very difficult area and most coasters were very supportive of the logging. So whatever they did, I think they would have had the same reaction. Mm. Yeah. And then, I mean, when I was going to say the end came, it came quite rapidly in the end, the logging, when it, it stopped, and it seemed, again, as you go through the book, you know, then the, I, I suppose, you know, the politics that plays the face. There was elections throughout this which cha seemed to change the stories, but in the early 2000s, it seemed to change the story quite substantially. Yeah. And personally, I believe that was because we infiltrated the system. Um, so we had people working in the beehive, including me, but people in much stronger positions than me. We infiltrated Forest and Bird. Uh, we, I mean, the, the in fact, mm -hmm. workers. Um, to the point that we have um, Jerry McSweeney and exactly. Craig Potton and that yeah, is, as, right. our, as our kind of ambassadors now. Yeah. Yeah. So in fact faded away as Forest and Bird became more radical. Um, and that was done extremely well organised, done around the country at, at branch level. But after the, what happened at Okarito with and Fidanaki, with the Forest and Bird came out at Fidanaki and Furiora against NFAC and supporting the Forest Service. So after that, NFAC had to take over Forest and Bird and it will infiltrate it. It was really a takeover. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, did, I did have a sweet smile on my story as I saw that a meeting in Wellington appointed Kevin Hackwell and, and uh, somebody else to chair and vice chair, and then the old guard got a bit word of it and called a special general meeting three weeks later and ousted them. So yeah, yeah. there was a bit of fighting in, yeah, in terms a lot of, of fight that. Back. Yeah. yeah, I call them the old guard that fought The back. old guard, yeah. Um, it, this, is a, this is a great book. I mean, seriously, I could not put this down, folk. I thought, I'm oh, picking up a tome, another story, history, you know, dates, figures. But this is a story. This is eminently a story about people and a very important story in the history of our conservation of our forests in New Zealand. Um, and Paul, I want to thank you for that. And I just want to open now to some questions and then come back to any closing, um, closing comments that we might have. So is there any questions from the audience? Got one over here. So what, what role did the general public play in this in throughout those decades, you know, the average Joe blogs? The, the public got more and more on board in the mid-1970s. Once they knew what was going on, um, and that was due to the amazing publicity that people like Annie Wheeler, who's somebody I haven't mentioned, Annie Wheeler was one of the conservation heroes, she was a journalist, but left journalism to work full-time for the Native Forest Action Council. She did an amazing work with publicity around the country. So we, we got the issue on TV, the newspapers. That, during the, this is one of the, the keys for the um, Puri Order campaign being su successful. The journalists that had been prepped beforehand by uh, Annie and, and Gwenny and others, so it was on all the front pages. So um, that came during the Maria Declaration. The Maria Declaration uh, became the, uh, at the time, record petition, more than Manapuri. I think Manapuri was 265,000 and Maria Declaration 340,000 signatures. So, um, and just the collection of the, the, the signatures meant door-to-door -door um, campaigning. We weren't we weren't using kind of collectivism back no, then. No, no. Sign up on social media website pages, were we? They had no. to be gathered. Yeah. In fact, tried and I think succeeded, according to the King brothers, in knocking on every door in Prime Minister Muldoon's electorate in Auckland. Mm. Yeah. Any more questions over here? Thank you.
Paul, uh, what do you consider to be the biggest, and first, thank you very much, and thank you all for just uh, this wonderful work that you've done. I arrived in New Zealand in 2001, and it's, I guess I got to enjoy so much of the fruits of what you've done. I just want to thank you. Um, what do you consider to be the biggest battles at present? At the moment? Yes. Um, well, New Zealand pest control. Uh, I mean, the government's promising to do a, a lot more about pest control. Um, and uh, you know, we've, the last government had a predator-free goal by 2050. Forest and bird has been hugely instrumental in that. So, um, and I, d I don't just mean possums. I mean, we've got all sorts of pests, new pests that we've got to deal with, curry, dieback included. Uh, so pest control in New Zealand is, a, for me, the biggest issue. Internationally, the fight for the forests is far from over. Um, we've got a foreword from Helen Clark here in which she talks about the international situation. So we've got something like 18 or 19 million hectares a year being cut down. Um, in Commonwealth countries like Australia and Canada, the forests, cutting down old forests is still very much an ongoing issue. Queensland, Australia, I've just found out recently, is cutting as much as Brazil is a year. Um, so Queensland, Australia is cutting something like a thousand rugby fields of forest a day, mostly for agriculture. And they call it, they call a lot of it scrub, but it's eucalypts woodland and it's, it's good wildlife habitat. So, um, yeah, this is, this is one part of the campaign, basically. <laughs> um, we've saved the forests, but we need to, to, to save them um, forever. We need to get rid of the pest control in New Zealand. Mm. I think get rid yeah, of the pests. Get rid of the pests. <laughs> Not the pest control. <laughs> no, I think you're right. I think like this year we're moving from 800,000 to a million hectares of, of predator control. I was talking with Graham Elliott here and he's talking about we probably need two to four million just in the beach mast response this year alone with the big beach mast we're going to see. So it's a very big battle. We might have time for one more question and then we'll, we'll wind up. Is there any more questions? Down the back. Oh, there's one there and one there. Oh, well, if, we're, if we're quick, we might do two. Is that all right, Madam Kerry? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, just carrying on from this, on the topic of pests, um, I think the real elephant in the room is lack of cat control. A cat on its owner's property is a pet. A cat outside the owner's property is a pest. And something has to be done about this. It is possible to contain cats, and I think it has to happen very soon. Yeah, I agree with that, um, but it, that's, a, that's a very, very <laughs> <laughs> controversial issue. Yeah, I yeah. know Gillian knows it's controversial. It's hard work, isn't it? Yeah. There was one here with the yellow. Can you tell us a little bit more about the role of Manapori in the fight for our forests? Right. Um, that, uh, Craig, Craig and I have discussed that as... It was very important to put it in the book because it was sort of um, a game changer in the um, in the way New Zealanders viewed themselves. I think is that was the first time we had this overarching conservation ethic, and people realised we needed to to save what we had. And before the Manapuri campaign, it was more a case of of uh, kind of lone lone wolf campaigners. I need to mention Perrine Moncrief, um, uh, Roy McGregor in, in Northland trying to save the curry for us, but Perrine Moncrief was one of the lone voice campaigners in the, in the early 20th century. And, and she became very um, important when NFAC and Forest and Bird were fighting because uh, she certainly came down on NFAC's side uh, about the need to change Forest and Bird. Perrine Moncrief was mostly responsible, she was, had the main responsibility for forming the Abel Tasman National Park. Um, but she also wrote uh, influential books. Um, but 
so she was like a lone, vo- lone wolf and there were several others, including locally. But the Manapuri campaign was the first big um, public conservation campaign. And that, and that felt like, as you said, that kind of kick-start moment. Yeah. Paul, is there anything... I, I mean, there's a, there's a quote that you, you um, put in your book, and I want to read it because I thought it was an interesting choice of quote, so I'll read it, and then I'll leave you with why you put it. Now, Paul doesn't know about this quote. <laughs> but it was a quote in the early 1820s by William Yeats, who... Um, he was a, a missionary uh, at the time of the early colonisers. And, and this quote, I thought, just summed up for me why we often do what we do with the forest. But I'll be interested as to why you put it in. The whole is so peaceful, so well suited for meditation and fitted to calm the ruffled passions of the soul that hearts even most insensitive to the beauties of nature must feel its influence, he wrote. Nor does the fragrance exhaled from the flowers and shrubs fail to increase the pleasure derived. Indeed, the whole atmosphere seems impregnated with perfumes. Sweets are borne upon the wings of every gale and every breath inhaled stimulates the system. So, yeah, one of the ironies was that the Bushmen, some of the Bushmen, he wasn't a Bushman, but many, many of the Bushmen who worked in the forest got to love the forest. And, and actually, I've included some of them too and the magnificent experiences they had. Ray Hammond was one, the Maori um, bush fellow who was a conservation hero. And he was cutting down kauri trees. He became... Um, a member of NFAC and ended up on the board. They um, were a long way away from the, the boardrooms <laughs> of the big forestry companies and, and came to love the forest. So I was just trying to, to give a feeling of what it's like to be in some of these forests and, and what inspired all of us. Because we came from tramping backgrounds mostly and we had experiences like that with the perfumes and the, the sounds of the birds and, and what have you. But, um, you know, when I heard you reading that, I'm thinking about forests in other countries, and I've been in tropical forests, and the amazing density of wildlife um, in forests in Southeast Asia I've been in, um, including in West Papua, and the need to do so much more. And Helen Clark says that we, we can't tackle climate change until we tackle the deforestation issue. Um, and a lot of people say, well, it's too big a, an issue. We, we, we can't do anything as ordinary people. But, I mean, at the moment, what we can do in New Zealand, well, we can stop buying quila. Uh, New Zealand and Australia are the main importers of quila, which is a, a tropical timber that only comes from Papua. Um, there's an area the size of Switzerland that Malaysia and um, Indonesia have, uh, are clear filling at the moment for, for palm oil. New Zealand uh, imports something like 2 million um, tonnes, I think, of palm kernel a year. Yeah, and I think a third of the world's total. There's huge areas in Borneo being clear filled for, for palm oil. So... Um, the battle goes on, doesn't it? That all goes on. Um, I would like to find a way of... I'd like to keep campaigning on this issue, actually. Uh, and I feel I haven't done enough. Um, and, and, and that we need to trap, uh, tackle the tropical forest issue um, a lot more, including in Queensland. Um, and, and Helen Clark says, you know, we can use this book as a way of lobbying, um, including as a government. Thank you. Paul, thank you very, very much for being here today and telling us your story and bringing together the stories of Fight for the Forest. Thank you too to those in the audience who have been a part of this journey. Much appreciate your work. Kia kaha, kia mano anui. Thank you very much, Paul, for coming today. Thank you.